So thank you, first of all, to the organizers for the opportunity to speak today. Um, my name is Luke Tull, and I am the team leader of the bioinformatics software development team at Achilles Therapeutics. So I am a paid employee of Achilles Therapeutics. Please bear that in mind. But the views I express are my own, uh, not of anybody at, else at Achilles Therapeutics. And today I'm going to be talking about the technical implementation details of our pipeline rather than some of the uh, research scientific aspects. So I will start off with a brief um, introduction to precision, <coughs> precision immuno-oncology, um, then what we're trying to do with our industrial pipeline development, how we're then implementing that within NextFlow, and our continuous integration strategy. So cancer immunotherapy is a very exciting new field of cancer treatment, which involves using the uh, patient's own immune system to target their particular cancer. It's um, gaining a lot of attention and there's lots of exciting breakthroughs. It was uh, declared the uh, breakthrough of the year by the AAAS in 2013. And this year you may have heard about uh, the um, Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine was awarded to two of the uh, breakthrough researchers for their work in that field. So there are a number of different types of immunotherapy. Uh, um, they revolve around the um, uh, molecular mechanisms uh, whereby a tumor cell may be recognized as abnormal by the immune system. So the, the, the Nobel Prizes were awarded for the um, T cell regulatory pathways, the PD1, PDL1, and CTLA4. Um, but there's also the uh, pathways associated with presentation of antigens on the surface of the tumor cell, which can then be recognized by the immune system. It's also, uh, yes, there's the important to bear in mind there are different types of antigen that might be presented. So um, the first class um, people uh, typically are targeting are the tumor-associated antigens. So these are antigens which are um, present in normal healthy cells, but overexpressed within certain types of cancers. So they may allow you to distinguish a cancer cell from a normal cell just from the fact that they are being presented, but there is a chance they may be presented on normal healthy cells as well. Um, a more promising uh, avenue which may allow you to more specifically target the tumor cells is by looking at tumor neoantigens. So these involve them, uh, identifying the mutations that have occurred within the tumor uh, and that are now being presented newly on that specific tumor and not on any of the healthy cells. And in this area, it's important to be aware that cancer is a genetic disease. Um, so for example, when, you, uh, when you, the um, gametes first fertilize and you have your uh, new organism growing, you'll have, you could say, no mutations present there, but just through the natural processes of life, you will start to acquire new mutations in some subset of your cells. Uh, and then there can be environmental factors, such as smoking is the, popular, is the, the famous one, that will cause new mutations to accrue. Many of these are benign passenger mutations, but eventually you might acquire a driver mutation, which is a mutation which starts to cause uh, a cancer to uh, appear. Um, and as that, that cancerous cell divides and acquires more mutations, uh, you might um, uh, pick it up as a cancer and start targeting with your therapy. And then the cancer will actually evolve due to that selective pressure that you're applying to it. And so you'll get different mutations present in different cells in response to those environmental factors. So it's helpful to understand cancer as a phylogenetic tree. So um, each of the differently colored cells here is a different uh, clone, i.e. a um, cell line with a identical uh, specific genotype. Um, and you might start off with a, a founder clone there on the uh, left-hand side, which starts to proliferate. Now, any cell that has arisen as a daughter cell or offspring of that original founder cell will have all of the mutations of that founder cell plus potentially some new ones. Um, and so you might get different clonal architectures. So there are different populations of cells with diff slightly different mutations present in them, but they will all have inherited the uh, mutations from their ancestors. And when you're sequencing this tumor at any time and point, you will be sequencing a multiple different subclones, so multiple different cells, uh, um, genotypes within those cells. Um, and it's very tricky trying to distinguish one from another and working out which, what is the clonal architecture here. And this is very important to understand for defining a therapy. So for example, if you target a mutation which occurred within the blue subclone line near the top there, you will be able to target all of those cells which share that particular mutation, but you won't be targeting any of the others. And so that might result in one of the other populations 
relapsing and producing a, 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 a new tumour as a result where you have killed off the blue cells but none of the others. Um, and this uh, hypothesis of uh, clonal targeting is actually backed up by um, some evidence. So uh, in 2016, there was a very important paper which was published showing that patients that had more clonal mutations, so more mutations early on in the cancer's development, which are shared by all of the cancer cells, patients with, the, uh, with those, many of those mutations are likely to survive for longer, have a better prognosis than those patients which have very few clonal mutations. So that leads us into where this might be used in a treatment. So the history of how this came about was that there was a, a large multi-center project called TracerX, which was looking into the mechanisms of cancer evolution. And this involves, uh, and it's still ongoing, but it's, it, it has, they've acquired a huge amount of data already. Um, they're aiming to uh, use a large patient cohort of almost 850 patients to do deep um, uh, DNA and RNA sequencing uh, of, those, of those individual patients' tumors from a very early stage, um, and then track how those tumors evolve over time um, in, in response to all sorts of different um, environmental factors. Uh, and it's revealed many very useful insights that are, are being put to good use, such as the response to selective pressures from the immune system, um, the mutational signatures that are present at different stages, and driver events that may occur. And it started out as a lung-only project, but has been broadened out into renal, melanoma, and prostate as well. And based on the research from this, the, some of the uh, researchers involved um, spotted that this might be an avenue for a therapy to try and target those uh, can uh, cancers within each of those patients. So they founded Achilles Therapeutics about two and a half years ago now, um, with the aim of, defining, of developing a large-scale um, precision immuno-oncology that could uh, target the clonal neoantigens present in an individual patient's tumor, and with the hope of potentially eradicating it and preventing relapse of that tumor as well. Uh, it was funded, it's, we're very lucky to be funded by, um, very generously by the uh, venture capital arm of the Wellcome Trust, which is called Syncona Limited. So the therapeutic pipeline that's envisaged for Achilles is um, stylized here. So it basically is, is, in high level terms, involves taking samples from each individual patient, including their tumor and their blood samples. Um, running that data through a bioinformatics pipeline to identify the clonal neoantigens, um, then creating a therapy based on that, which could be something along the lines of um, a synthetic cancer vaccine, a T-cell therapy, uh, induced or expanded uh, patients' own, own immune uh, T-cells, and then returning that back to the patient along with an adjuvant checkpoint inhibitor therapy to attempt to target and kill that patient's tumor cells, and specifically so as well, so that you don't end up with off-target effects. And we are about to begin our um, phase one trials um, very imminently in the early part of next year. Uh, but what we're talking about today is that first bioinformatics pipeline where we're identifying the clonal knee antigens. So this being a clinical process, we have to have a slightly more rigorous development life cycle than you might be familiar with um, to make sure that we are um, respecting the patients and being, being uh, careful about our patient data. So we have to be flexible to new data that comes around and change the pipeline in response to new discoveries. We have to make sure the pipe, that pipeline is constantly working well and giving you uh, constantly improving output, uh, make sure the data is secure, uh, that the intellectual property and the patient's own identifying data are all kept carefully under control. And that the pipeline should also be cost effective as well. We can't spend a huge amount of money on it. And we do this through an agile uh, development strategy whereby we can iterate over the ideas and continually try to improve the pipeline and respond to new information. So the pipeline that we have developed, we're calling the Peleus pipeline. Uh, it differs from the original TracerX pipeline in quite a few key areas. Um, so for example, the TracerX pipeline is a research only pipeline, uh, whereas Peleus is um, catering to a clinical process. Um, it, where the TracerX pipeline was trying to address many different research questions and potentially open-ended questions, whereas we're focused on one very specific application. Um, we also have to make sure that our pipeline runs from beginning to end, giving you the same results regardless of when you run it and who runs it, um, and without any manual intervention. We don't want any operators to be making key decisions 
um, for the patient. Um, we also need to be portable as well. So uh, we didn't have access to the original academic infrastructure. We had to uh, set up our own infrastructure, but we don't want to be tied to any one place. We want to be able to move around if we need to um, for any reason. And we also have to justify the licensing of any external software or find uh, alternatives as a result. And the ability to scale at a moment's notice to be able to run from one to a huge number of patients concurrently if we need to. So a very high level overview of the pipeline is here for you to see. Um, I won't go into too much detail about it right now, but the, the important things to be aware of is that it, it's composed of multiple different modules which have their own discrete outputs and can run in isolation from one another, and in fact should run in isolation from one another, but they can also be hugely parallelized. So there's many places within this pipeline where you can run multiple modules at the same time, and within each of the modules you can also run aspects of them uh, concurrently. Uh, to give you a huge improvements in your uh, runtime. Uh, and we also collect a huge amount of QC data at every step of the way. So there's lots of different outputs that need to be combined together and easy to understand and manage and back up and uh, reproduce if necessary. So that brings us on to the implementation of this pipeline within Nextflow. Why did we choose Nextflow? So it seems like a silly question here, but it is important to actually ask, answer that question. Um, we inherited a academic pipeline from the TracerX team, um, and it was written entirely in R with hard-coded job submission, job scheduling for their particular infrastructure. So we needed to rewrite a lot of that work ourselves anyway, um, but we also took the opportunity to consider using a different workflow engine rather than hard-coded within R. Um, we, I've had a lot of experience with many different workflow engines. I've used uh, Makefiles, obviously, and SnakeMake, and uh, dabbled with a few other tools. But at the time, I was looking through the things that we needed to address. So we needed something that was portable, that would give you reproducible outputs, um, that would simplify the parallelization. We want to deal with the, the scientific aspects. We didn't want to have to rewrite something that just already been implemented elsewhere. Um, we wanted, very particularly, we want to be able to support for multiple languages because the pipeline was written in R, but we also had Python components and uh, we wanted to be able to use Orc and whatever tool was right for the job at any one time. And we wanted to make sure that the, the pipeline was fail safe. This is a big thing for us as well. We didn't want a partially complete output file being used or reused in a, in a subsequent run of the pipeline and corrupting our data. And um, uh, Paolo and others have put together a last year uh, paper that was detailing the comparison between um, Nextflow and many of the other languages. And in all the areas that we were looking at and many more, Nextflow is definitely the obvious choice. So when we set about implementing it, modularization was a key issue for us. We wanted to be able to have separate workflows that could be managed separately and without a huge monolithic script that was controlling everything. It would be unmanageable, unmaintainable. So we needed a modularization approach. And Paolo was talking earlier about the, um, the, the combining multiple workflows. And we couldn't wait for something to be implemented. And there is a issue that's been in the backlog for quite a while now to address that. But we had to have some kind of work around. Our basic approach has been to run nested workflows at up to three deep. Beyond three deep, it becomes, manu uh, it becomes unmanageable. But at the high level, you have the, the main workflow manager. Then you'll have a module workflow, and then you'll have a component within that module that may be run. And those can all be parallelized within, uh, relative to one another. And we pass uh, data between these modules through YAML. Um, it gets a lot of flack from different quarters, but it is mostly human readable and computer readable. And um, there's existing Groovy and Java libraries that allow you to parse and serialize it, which makes it very convenient. So it essentially involves create, having for each sub workflow two steps, one first step where you're generating your parameters file. So you can take a whole chunk of your existing input params and pass that onto your sub workflow, or you can generate your own parameters based on that specifically for it. And then you have your subsequent process where you call out to your workflow, giving it the new parameters file. And to facilitate this, we created a Java library that, we, um, al that allows us to find the module within a uh, NXF class path environment variable. Um, incidentally, the code I'm presenting here um, is all being put into a, a shared Git repo, which I'll be posting the, the, the URL for. So um, you can be able to try it out for yourself later. Another key thing for us was containerization. Um, so Nextflow makes containerization really simple. 
uh, in all but one minor area, which is that we have a large amount of static data which is shared across pipeline runs and sits outside of our working directory. Um, so we have something like 150 gigabytes of data which is static and used in every single run um, and uh, would be mounted typically under the slash data path. Uh, something that we did to make this much easier is that we've created our own tiny little label here and a stage in mode called relative symlink, uh, rel link here, which allows us to um, just uh, label any process that we want to run in Docker with the um, BioEnv, in this case, label, and that process will then be run within our Docker image and we'll have all of the paths that we want to access to mounted under the slash host directory within that Docker container. So we have access to the entire host system, file system without any potential for collision, and it, it's very easy. It makes, makes life much, much, much easier. We also do a lot of embedding of different languages within our workflows. Um, so um, th this is, again, very easy within the next flow. Uh, we use our own Docker image with containing our software we need, and then we can run R or any other language. The thing to be aware of, in a, particularly in a clinical pipeline, is that we have to make sure we um, escape our input parameters properly. Everybody always assumes that there's never going to be a space in their file names until there is a space in their file names and their workflow fails. So it's, it's important to be careful and check for that sort of thing. Um, it's easy to do, but it's easy to overlook as well. One paradigm we use a, a great deal is the split map group um, facility of Nextflow. So Nextflow makes parallelization of uh, defined jobs very easy. It also makes chunking um, uh, input data very easy as well. So there's chunking available for plain text, for CSV or TSV files, and for FASTA files. So you can quite quickly chunk that into blocks that can be run in parallel. Uh, but you often need to be able to map where those chunks came from if you want to re uh, reorder the file back to how it was. So we typically start off by taking our input channel, splitting it down into chunks, um, appending an additional variable, which is the uh, chunk number running our process and then downstream after the process, regrouping and sorting the, the output data. So this allows all the job chunks to be run in parallel and then restored to the originals that they were in the input files. Uh, we make very heavy use of asserts and if empties. I think it sometimes gets a bit overlooked in pipeline writing, but this captures a lot of errors that, uh, that would otherwise be overlooked. Uh, we, we put assert statements throughout, checking whatever assumptions we've made so that when they eventually are uh, the assumptions are wrong, we get them flagged as early as possible. Uh, and if empty also saves us from running pipelines with empty input, appearing to look like they're working perfectly fine, but actually doing nothing and wasting time and money in the process. So just a simple if empty at the end will save you a lot of money and time. We also use a lot of map-based channels. So we often find that we don't want a single file being fed through the system one by one. We have a file plus multiple pieces of metadata be to be kept together and propagated through a channel. Um, with a list-based uh, channel, this can sometimes become a bit difficult to keep track of. You might find that you've reordered the channel or that you're adding a new value to it and you have to then refactor all of the downstream code. It's made a lot easier if you use a map-based channel. So you essentially have a key and value pair for each item on your channel. You can then access just the items that you're interested in each process and propagate it without having to worry about reordering and changing and additions and so on. So we then also have a continuous integration process. Uh, unit testing and in continuous integration is getting a lot of attention, uh, but not so much in workflows, uh, sadly. Uh, Nextflow actually makes it very easy to do, but I haven't seen a lot of discussion about this yet. Um, essentially, you want to be able to selectively run a single process um, with a small amount of input data, test that the output from that one process is doing the right thing, but you don't want to necessarily run the entire workflow. The workaround and easy implementation is to use the stored uh, directive and resume your workflow. So you don't have to retain your work directory and your .nextflow directory to resume it. If you store the output in a, name, in a semantic location, an output folder, you can resume your pipeline, give it some dummy input for all the processes you don't want to run, or, and just the input that you're interested for the, for the, test, for the process that you're testing. Um, and it will run that one process, give you the output from that very quickly, and you can check that it is doing the right thing. And um, you're controlling for changes that you might be making over time, which could otherwise break as an individual process. 
Uh, it's a similar story with the integration testing. So in this case, you want to be able to run an entire module at a time. If you do a modularization approach that, such as we're, we're, we're doing, this can be very easy. You can run just that one module. Uh, but similarly, if you want to test the interface between modules, you'll need all the modules that you're not running to be not run. You can control that through parameterization or through stirder if you want to, and then test the output from one module into the input from the next and then into the output from your downstream module. Again, Storder or something similar, and you can very much, very quickly catch a lot of simple bugs which otherwise get overlooked. So, and we also do uh, a lot of regression testing. This is not specific to Nextflow, but um, we personally would love if there was some system for uh, facilitating regression testing, but it's the same as it would be in any other situation. You have to prepare a data set with known qualities, run your pipeline, and compare outputs and control what changes are taking place to make sure they're within acceptable boundaries. But this is a must have for a clinical pipeline and can take it from being something that you consider to be, this might be the right answer, right answer to something where you have a lot of trust that it's not been broken by some tiny little thing that you've overlooked. So in conclusion then, Nextflow makes writing these um, clinical pipelines and large scale uh, with lots of you great new features for reproducibility uh, and for parallelization. It makes it all very easy and very fun and we're very happy that we're using Nextflow. But you still have to be careful that the pipeline is doing what you're doing, you want it to do. You can't just trust uh, that it's doing the right thing. You don't want to be sending huge amounts of data between multiple cloud service providers, for example, or um, passing corrupt data to a, next, a downstream channel. There are some growing pains and the modularization is uh, was one of our, our biggest uh, growing pains. It's, it, it, it's, it's a, an effective workaround, what we've developed, but uh, there's a lot of potential for improvements in the maintainability and the uh, reproducibility there. Um, it's also important to have a multi-layered testing framework from the very small quick tests, just to check that you've not got a typo, to the larger regression testing to make sure that you've one update of a, a package somewhere hasn't completely changed your results of your pipeline. And the validation can take you from being just a, a pipeline that kind of does the right thing to something where you trust it and you know that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge that this is obviously a work of many different people from uh, Achilles, from my collaborators and from my co-workers at Achilles, through to the uh, TracerX consortium. And of course, thank you to the Nexler community for the ongoing and fantastic efforts that you're putting in there. Um, I would love to collaborate with people on some of the uh, modularization, the um, integration and unit testing frameworks that we put in place. Um, if this is something that you're interested in, please do get in touch with me. And if you want to try out any of the code, I'll be putting all of the code that I've uh, presented here up on that uh, Bitbucket repo. And that is me.